A very warm welcome everybody uh, at the most difficult presentation of the day because right after lunch all the blood goes to your stomach and I have to bring it back up so it's kind of a bit of a challenge especially with this topic of course which is an EU directive if anything is not sexy I would say it's an EU directive agree right <laughs> it's like yeah so uh, um, how do I get into NIST 2.0 well actually this is a funny story it's my colleague I uh, was doing events with partners. He's like, hey, um, I hear a lot about NIST 2.0. Tony, did you, did you look at that? And I said like, no, no clue. Uh, to be honest, I never, I even didn't even hear from NIST. Anyone heard from NIST before this one? Oh, oh yeah, a lot of people. Good, good. But yeah, I said like, no, I'll dive into it. And then I read the NIST 2.0 documentation, which of course is written by professionals in Brussels in a way that you go like, everything has to be covered in a way. It's very very dry uh, stuff there to read. But overall, I got the idea of like what they tried to achieve. And I go like, wow, this is really going to be impacting a lot of companies, you know, even if you don't fall on the NIST 2.0. So I made a presentation for that. And since then, I've been delivering this presentation. And uh, I was talking to Kurt on uh, the Experts Live event. And he said, like, hey, Tony, what are you presenting on? And I said, well, I'm doing a lot of talks actually on NIST 2.0. Nothing with Microsoft, nothing technical. He said, oh, oh, that might actually be an interesting topic. And given you all showed up here, I think that resonates uh, uh, good with you. So I will take you through a little bit of uh, the NIST 2.0, uh, obviously where it comes from. And well, I'm not going to go explain like uh, what, what is the state of the world and everything like that in great detail. But I just wanted you to get out there. There's a couple of things I really recommend everyone to look at. And the first one is actually to look at um, 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 this one is the National Cybersecurity Center uh, for the Netherlands. And most likely, if you're not from the Netherlands, your country also has their local cybersecurity center, everything like that. They have a document that says the um, Cybersecurity Build Nederland. This really looks at like what the Cybersecurity Defense Center sees happening in the Netherlands. And you know what is uh, common attacks that they see, what is patterns that they see, and everything like that. Now, as Microsoft, we also have such a document, which is the Digital Defense Report. Uh, we'll have a big, quick look at it uh, later. Um, I know Kent also uh, mentioned this document in his, uh, uh, in his presentation, but this really gives you the idea of like what is going on. And to summarize it for you, if you're like, oh, I don't feel like reading a lot of uh, documents on that, but to summarize it for you, um, attackers nowadays is big, big business. Well, no surprise there. But I don't really think that a lot of companies fully grasp the notion of that this is a billion dollars industry. There's literally billions of revenue going around in these uh, attacker companies. Also, what you see is that many of them are state funded or either state sponsored. I talked to uh, Michael, uh, who did a session on the, uh, uh, on the uh, different uh, tax, right? And he mentioned as well that Russia now changed their law on cyber um, attacks. Whereas, like, if you do cyber attacks, by default, that was, like, of course, punishable by the law and everything like that. But they changed that law and they said, like, um, cyber attacks is punishable by the law unless it does not conflict with Russia's interest. So that sort of gives you, like, the letter to go do whatever you want. And, of course, Russia also... What you see, North Korea, um, Iran, China, these are com countries that have on their payroll uh, hackers, uh, people that go into an office in the morning and their job is really to breach, see what they can get, see where they can go and everything like that. Also, you see that their methods and what they're doing, how they're doing it is changing. China was known for being like uh, really running around, just kicking everything and being very loud and obnoxious. And then all of a sudden they went really silent. And then for years you didn't see that much of them. And all of a sudden now you see very sophisticated attacks. Like I don't know if you've seen the uh, attack that Microsoft also recently had, where they actually went as far as going into a file they found on the internet uh, from a, a virtual machine that had a memory d dump file in it. And then from this memory dump file they extracted a signing key. And this signing key was used to attack. And that is for me, really sophisticated. Yeah? Also, we see attacks against accounts that have cloud solutions. So 
when you have a Microsoft Azure subscription, or you have the Microsoft Google Cloud, or you have Amazon Web Services, doesn't matter. What we now see is attacks where the attackers are actually trying to see if they have access to one of these subscriptions. If not, then they do elevated privileges until they do get access to subscriptions. And what do they do with these subscriptions? Well, the first thing you're going to do is turn on everything that's related to cost management, monitoring, and everything like that. They leave everything running that is, but then they're going to spin up new VMs, and they love those VMs with the GPUs, the graphical processing uh, power, because they're going to do crypto mining. And crypto mining is not by far in any way lucrative when you do that on a cloud service, unless you don't have to pick up the bill. So this is the attack they're doing. So we're talking to partners and say, like, look, please make sure these cloud subscriptions are secure. Make sure that you have MFA on them. Make sure that you have them protected. And they go like, yeah, but that one is empty. As for dev test, there's nothing in there. And we go like, yeah, but this is a new scenario. They're not going to get anything. They're coming to bring you something. And I've personally spoken with partners that had their Microsoft invoice for Azure to be a bit of a surprise when it was 60K more than they expected. And I have to say that was the most optimistic one. I've also had cases where the invoice was $2 million. And then you're going to get a discussion like, yeah, but uh, yeah, um, who's going to pay for this? Well, you sort of didn't secure it, right? So where's the responsibility here? Avoid this discussion. Make sure that you have that. Uh, attackers, what you also see in these documents is they have real management. So there's a CEO that determines what do we do, what do we not do, right? So they're really going to look at a focus area. They're going to have a mission statement like a good company has, like this is our mission statement, this is what we stand for, this is what we're going to focus on. What do they focus on? Such a company can say, like, all we're doing is initial access broking. So they're not going to do any hacking, any data extracting, anything like that. All they do is try to get into a system through, uh, you know, uh, um, um, IoT devices that are published, or uh, try to use vulnerabilities in systems, use phishing emails, everything like that. They take all these access they have, make a nice bundle, put a nice price on it, and they sell that off to the next company. The next company might be a company that specializes in ransomware as a service. You can't make these things up, right? You have EAS, PaaS, SaaS, and now you have RAS. Ransomware is a service, yeah. And what they do is like, oh, you have access somewhere. Great, you can get our company to come in, and we will do all the ransomware installations. We'll make sure everything is encrypted. And then when it's ready, we just flip the switch, and then you get the, oops, your files are encrypted box. But hey, look, there's a phone number you can call, and guess what? They have a great help desk. Because billions of dollars buys you good people for the help desk. And be, I'm sorry too, man, but uh, yeah, let me just help you uh, pay the ransomware and then we can, uh, you can get to work again. And when it comes to ransomware attacks, also what um, a lot of people are like, yeah, but we have a disaster recovery, we have our backups, we have everything in place. And they go like, like Michael explained as well, have to look at the economic impact as well. If your backup takes a day to restore, and the company is losing a million an hour, yeah, then that day is going to be more expensive than paying the ransomware. And that's why these companies are so successful. That's why they're in business. They make exactly the economic sweet spot. They look at the revenue, they look at the impact, and they say, like, okay, if they're going to build everything from scratch, they're going to re repair everything, it's going to cost them X, so we're just going to go and take a tenth of X, which you can afford, and then that's the ransomware. Yeah, so they, they do smart things like that. They have huge investment, they do a lot of automation, they have a lot of collaboration. So there is the, th the, the thing that we're up against. So what we're seeing is, like, because it is so incredible lucrative, that obviously the number of attackers, the number of threats that we see is going up rapidly. And then if you look at our cyber defense or cyber resiliency uh, for the Netherlands or for other countries as well, it really lags behind. So if this continues this way, uh, we keep paying the ransomware, then obviously we're just going to get more and more attacked. Also, the idea that, oh, my company is too small, I'm not interesting, I don't have anything worth, like you, you can take it all. Yeah. Fine, they will take it all then, you know, it, because 
it's, it's random. It's, it's shooting with a shot of hail and see what sticks, where do we get in? And when we get in, what do we get, get out of it, yeah? Uh, data exfiltration is a big thing right now, so you see a lot of companies that get hacked, and then they don't even bother with doing all the encryption of things, they just copy all the data they can get from your, from your environment, from your uh, infrastructure, and they say like, hey, how much would you pay for not having this information public on the internet? And then you have to scratch your head, you go like, what's in there? Um, what, what documents do I have? What emails do I have? And everything like that. And then you remember you had this little mistress you were mailing back and forth, maybe not good to have on the internet, I don't know. But uh, yeah, so uh, data exfiltration. Uh, the other attacks that we're seeing is uh, a lot of companies have IoT devices, so when I, as a hacker, get onto a network, the first thing I want to look for is where can I survive the longest? And there's not that laptop or server that might have updates or that might have uh, antivirus on it, no, that might be an IoT device. The other attack for ransomware that we're seeing is OT networks. And this is really about every factory, every big uh, manufacturing plant that has a lot of those devices that control the pumps, uh, conveyor belts, engines, um, temperature sensors, you name it. Really, that is the whole factory runs through, through those software. Traditionally, in, in a lot of companies I've been at as well, um, the companies that do that OT technology are not really the best in security, I would say. It's not main focus. The main focus is to get that factory running, get it running efficiently and everything like that. So many of the solutions I've seen is like, yeah, yeah, we just put, they put a PC there with the local admin account, the software runs on there, and that's what they're doing. Who patches that machine, who manages that machine, you have to explain it to them. In some cases, I've been involved with, so I think that's the worst of the worst you could get. But you see ransomware where they take over the whole OT network and they say like, look, you have to pay us ransomware or we're gonna put all your machines, conveyor bands, everything, in three times the speed. Now, guess what? It will not give you three times as much products. <laughs> this will cause some problems along the line somewhere, you know, and uh, obviously, what is the cost of a um, factory going off the rails like that? It's, it's, it's of course, huge. So, um, uh, other attacks that we're seeing, of course, is a lot of phishing. Um, don't know if any one of you have ever seen it, how a phishing attack goes from the hacker point of view. So I have a video. This is a presentation. I saw a presentation from Jan Bakker. He's an MVP, Microsoft Value Professional. And I was blown away by this. He shows a demo of how to set up Evil Ginx. That's a tool for hackers to create a, a man-in-the-middle attack. And then how they fish his Office 365 uh, credentials. So on his website, there's this video as well. What you see on the left is Evil Ginx, and that's a tool for hackers. And if you were in any doubt, it's on the left. It looks evil as well, right? So, and, and what you see there is there's many lines there. It's not so clear right now, but every line is basically an attack they can uh, emulate. So it's going to be you know, Coinbase, Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, Office 365, eBay, Booking, whatever. It's all, you can all emulate it. So what you do is you uh, register a URL, you connect that URL to Evil Genix, they create an SSL certificate for it, and then you're good to go. You need to get your URL then to your uh, victim. Um, when the victim opens the phishing URL, then uh, it's not that it will emulate the Microsoft 365 page, because it's man in the middle, so they will go on your behalf to the Microsoft service, also grab your customizations, your logos, and everything like that. So as soon as the person puts in their, their username here, you can see the background loads, the, 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 the logo loads, and his password here, 3MLH, he logs in, he has MFA. So he's gonna approve it on his phone, do the face ID, and now stay signed in. Well, yes, no, it doesn't matter, and oh, I'll get to the login page again. I must have done something wrong, and I'm gonna type it in again, but now I do get to the portaloffice.com, so it sh everything should be fine. What you see on the left, however, is, and let me zoom in here, is that, uh, first of all, the username and password, which is absolutely not visible for your point of view, I think, because green on black is not the best solution, but uh, yeah, you can, um, it doesn't get any better, but right there you see the username and password in clear text, but what it really uh, is uh, interesting here is this one, uh, that it says tokens and captured. 
because what, did this, uh, what this did is because it's man in the middle, they were intercepted the MFA token. Now what the hacker is gonna do is they're gonna go and go to the office page. Um, when the pop-up comes from to log on, they go and to the cookie editor. So they edit the cookie and from that token, they just copy that whole text, they paste it in there. And now they're gonna do refresh. No username, no password, no MFA. Now, this is a short-lived window that you can leverage, but it, this is automated, right? So as soon as you fall for this, then people can, uh, can go for that. And I was blown away, especially by the fact that I thought, like, well, authenticator MFA is good, right? But they can do the same, obviously, with an SMS, where they can intercept that or, or do things like that. Um, when you have a Intune managed device, then you can look at uh, what we're, Microsoft now is trying to uh, to counter these sorts of attack is that in the token we will paste a unique key for that machine so it cannot re be replayed on another machine so those are things we're doing but what I would recommend if, if you were about this kind of attacks with your admin accounts especially your global admin accounts look at your conditional access policies you have the option now to enforce for uh, specific roles like global admins to enforce phishing resistant MFA and what phishing resistant MFA does is it forces you to use a FIDO key, a Windows Hello, which uses a TPM chip in the machine, or use a smart card, because then there's nothing to uh, capture or to intercept there. So um, obviously with all these things going on, you can see there's uh, the need to really uh, um, um, lift up the cyber resiliency of uh, all companies. Uh, obviously, technology is great, technology can help, but you also need to look at people, as long as people, uh, yeah, phishing uh, attacks is a great example of that. When, when we just saw that attack, right, I'm now logged in as that user. What these attackers then do is see like, okay, how much access do I have, what can I reach? What is the most interesting person I want to go jump to next? So from this mailbox, I will look at the history, look at who he writes with, about what topic, what company, whatever. And now I'm going to send an urgent email with some documents attached with the, uh, with the, with the request that the other person uh, immediately responds to this. And now this attack comes from within. So who doesn't open the document, right? It's really that kind of sophisticated attacks that they're doing. The other thing is really important, obviously, is to look at your processes. And I think this is also something that a lot of company can uh, really further development. And the best example for that I can give you is like we have great processes in place when I uh, scream fire, because we all have a notion of like, okay, that's equal to danger, where is it? And how do I get to the other side of that? Yeah, um, probably ab above the ceiling here, they'll have the smoke detectors, they have the sprinklers, there's uh, those big fire, uh, hoses hanging, they have uh, fire extinguishers. Everything is in place, right? There's even a meeting point outside. Uh, there's buttons you can press if there's fire. And also we all know which phone number to dial. So you can see there that there is where we really have learned from, okay, fire, fire bad. So we need to have processes to make sure that it ha doesn't happen. If it does happen, we can counter it immediately. Um, uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, a lot of companies do, does, does not have this in place. Who of you has the physical manual standing in your company, emergency handbook for a cyber attack? Okay, yeah. Oh, good session now, uh, guys. <laughs> yeah, because like, oh, you know, you have this company. Yeah, we have a great uh, manual written for what to do with a cyber attack. It is on the server. Uh, which we can't reach. So that's not a good solution. Why a physical handbook? Because you can take it, you need to put in there, and there's of course all samples on it on the internet, what you really want to cover there, but just from my top of head, like who's going to do what? Who's going to be responsible? Who's going to do the communications? What phone numbers do we need to call? Who's our suppliers? Who, who runs our OT? Who runs our, uh, who's our partner? Um, because the thing is like, not everybody might have their uh, supplier or their contact in their mobile phone on the speed dial. So uh, that's one thing to put in there. The other thing I really recommend to put in there is put all your top customers in there with their contact, the uh, uh, security contact, uh, reach out to them and say like, hey, if we have a security incident, who do I need at your side? Who do, who do I call? Because when you are looking at the oops, you've been encrypted 
screen. You have no idea what's happening with your data and if they launch from your environment an attack to your customers because they have that same sense of who you write with, uh, what the topics are about, and so they can launch it. I've literally seen an attack where a transport company was breached, and they didn't know that, but their whole database was extracted, and then the attackers did a mail merge to all their customers, said like, hey, we're sorry, we were at your address, you know, insert address here, um, at random time, random, uh, random name. Unfortunately, you did not open the door for the package we have to deliver to you. Would you mind opening the document and fill out what options would be available for you so then we can pick that up and plan a new delivery date? And the company I uh, worked with, they opened the document and uh, thank goodness one other user saw all the files on the file share going uh, into weird characters and everything like that, so I unplug all the cables. And that's how we we got around it, but it, yeah, it's just like that sort of attacks, right? So processes in place. And of course, this is also something that NIST 2.0 really looks into. And NIST 2.0 is really because of like, if you look at the cybersecurity reports, if you look at the state of the world, yeah, obviously we need to really think about uh, going uh, one layer deeper in our in our uh, cyber defense. So I'll take you through the existing regulations, then I'll look at the directive itself, what does it mean, what do you have to do, what's your duties, then the sanction if you don't do it, and then when will this be active. Now, um, when we look at the directive itself, uh, initially it's very specific for the essential companies of the country. So we'll dive into that, but also we'll dive into why it will be relevant for every company in my opinion. So let's look at the regulations today. There actually is a specific regulation for anything that is network communication related. That is the European Electronic Communication Code, EECC. And this is a directive that is specifically for you know, mobile teleco providers, telco providers, but also the companies that do the backbone of the internet. So they have a set of regulations on what they need to have in place to make sure that this doesn't go down uh, uh, um, and all the things like that. Obviously they said like, okay, what we do for the backbone of the internet and mobile communications, etc., is also relevant for any power company or, uh, or water supplies or uh, um, finance markets, anything like that. So they created the NIS, is similar duties as the EECC, but then really directed um, for the operators of essential services. And included there as well is digital service providers. So that's the differentiation they make there. Now, with the NIS, every country itself needs to look at what is the operator of an essential service for you, Netherlands, Belgium, France, whatever. And they have to determine what that is. So, so one country will say like, oh yeah, of course, hospitals are very important for us. So, these are the 6,000 hospitals we have, and we want them to have this and this in place. We're going to monitor that, et cetera, et cetera. Where another country might say like, yeah, okay, hospitals are important, but not as important as my financial money. So you get difference per state. Now, and if I operate, obviously, over multiple state, then in this country I have to do that. In the other country I have to do that. Some meeting started. Thank you. <laughs> Um, but so uh, it's by the member state that you uh, that has to de determine that, right? Now in the Netherlands we have the Wet Beveiliging Network and Informatie Systemen, which is basically based on that NIS. So to really go and to say like, okay, this is what we recommend for uh, and and the, 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 the regulations for the operators of essential services. Now the thing is when you look at the, the NIS uh, now. Uh, NIST describes that you have the duty to notify regulators on security incidents. So if you, have, uh, you fall under the NIST and you have a security incident, you have to notify regulators on that. There's a whole process on that and everything like that. And then also you have the duty to take appropriate and proportional technical and organizational measures to manage the risk posed to the security of the network and information systems. And that line is just awesome, isn't it? Somebody thought really long and hard on that and in the EU and he goes like, and he finally went to his colleague and said, like, I got it. This is the line that covers everything. This, here it is. So, but uh, unfortunately, that's as far as they went because like the duty to notify is very well documented, 
but what you need to do and how that looks is uh, very little details. Also there, again, brought back to the national regulators, so like, yeah, we're not going to mandate what you should uh, uh, enforce on these on, on this, uh, uh, essential operators and what you, uh, what you should check. Well, um, obviously there's a lot debate on what uh, uh, NIST, with the whole change and everything that uh, came after that, they look like, okay, we really need to revamp this, it needs to be better, so they wrote NIST 2.0. So NIST 2.0 says, okay, first of all, big portion of that EECC, the European Electronic uh, Communication Code, is going to be rolling up into NIST 2.0. So we bring those together. Also, we don't have the requirement that countries will have to identify uh, the operators of essential service. We have the companies covered, and we have two categories, which is Annex 1 and Annex 2. Now, if we zoom in there, you will see that on the left, which is high critical, so for every country we determined, in the EU has determined this high critical, which is energy, transport, banking, financial, health, wastewater. Then the digital infrastructure, right? Here you can really see that EECC thing come in. But look at this one also, ICT service management, business to business, managed service providers are listed under the critical uh, operators for uh, the country. So they fall under NIST 2.0. Um, then you see everything that is other. Everything with other basically goes like anything that does production, manufacturing, distribution of uh, chemicals, food, medical devices, computer, electronics, optical, etc., etc. Uh, it's all covered in there. Now, there's exception. Obviously, if you're a small company, uh, you have less than 50 employees, and you have list less than uh, 10 million uh, revenue, then unless you're one of the former EECC companies, uh, then you don't fall under NIST 2.0. We like say you're too small, but however, you can also look at it that way, like, okay, even if I don't fall under this, what is the duties, what is the regulations, yeah? Okay, so NIST, First one talked really about having to report the incidents. NIST 2.0 extended that and also said like, okay, besides the incidents, we're gonna also cover threats. So a company that sees a incident or discovers a threat is required to submit to the CSIRT. So this is how it's described in the NIST, Computer Security Incident Response Team. Most likely in the Netherlands, this will be the Cyber Security Center. Um, uh, but that is, of course, still to be uh, announced. Now, within 24 hours after becoming aware, you must provide early warning. After 72, uh, within 72 hours, provide an incident notification. Upon request, you have to do an intermediate report. But then this really interesting, this one, no longer than one month after the incident or after the uh, a threat, you have to f submit a final report. And this final report, needs to describe the description of the incident, severity, impact, uh, type of threat, root cause, and also what did you do to prevent it from happening again. Now, the CSRT can look at this report and says, like, hmm, interesting. This might be happening to a lot more companies, so we're going to ask you to, we're going to make this report public. So now, the report is going to be out there in the open, and this will also, of course, then uh, show what people need to do to prevent in their company to help this from happening. So uh, this is going to be interesting, obviously, because if the report is published, also you attack, oh, that one really worked. So yeah, so it's going to be there a lot of uh, work with that. Um, when we look at companies, there might be a board of directors, there might be a CEO, and it goes like, yeah, great, but cybersecurity, not my thing. I don't know anything about it. Uh, so yeah, uh, I make somebody else responsible for that. That is great, but not when you fall on the NIST 2.0, because here we're going to say the management body, board members, director of thing, have to approve the measurements to do cybersecurity risk management. They have to supervise the implementation and be accountable for non-compliance. That means that if I'm um, the CEO of a big uh, water company and I go like, yeah, we don't believe in it and it's not relevant and I have somebody that does that 
and something goes really bad there, then the CSRT or the security center can come. Well, you obviously didn't do your job, and it can go as far as evict you from your role, from your, uh, uh, from your work. Um, uh, needs to be trained as well on cybersecurity risk management and uh, practices there. Now, this is what anyone that falls on the NIST 2.0 needs to do. And this is the duties. I think this is the most important part of NIST 2.0 because it really just puts a list there with like, at the very least, have this in place. And it's not rocket science what they put here. It's nothing more than like basic cybersecurity hygiene, you know? Risk analysis and information system security policies. You have incident handling. Make sure you have business continuity, backup management, disaster recovery, crisis management, and for the sake of everything, just test those things as well. I'm not gonna call out everything else that's in here, but you can see it's pretty basic. There's nothing there like really a, a, a rocket science, right? Really uh, specifically mentioned here is Use of multi-factor authentication, uh, very important. So, so if you still have accounts that don't use MFA, turn on MFA. Yes, I showed you a video where you can see in the authenticator, they can capture that token, but that's still more, um, uh, more secure than having no MFA at all. Now, the most interesting duty that I saw in this 2.0 is this one, and it is the fact that if you are falling on the NIST 2.0, then not all risks are on your company, on your side, because we have a supply chain. So as part of the NIST 2.0 duties, I have to look at my supply chain and see how things are arranged there. And now it becomes interesting, and that's why I say like every company might be affected by this, because if you don't fall on the NIST 2.0, but you do deliver to a company that falls on the NIST 2.0, then that company might come to you like, okay, what's my impact? What's my risk with you as our supplier, right? And whether that's just the shipping of goods, okay, fine. But if you get hacked, I don't get my goods, what's the impact for me there? What's my risk there? You know, my, uh, if I'm, 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 I'm on the stock market, then of course that might be a financial uh, hurt that I've heard from there. Um, we all know the example, I think, um, if some of you go to Albert Heijn, you might remember the fact where you go like, hey, no cheese? I remember that very clearly, go, why, why is there no cheese? No, no cheese at all, right? And of course, then later it comes out that the transport company was hacked, so many trucks stood uh, along the way, nothing could be done about it, and that is supply chain, right? So, uh, other than that, I could say like, even if you don't fall on the NIST 2.0, how many of these can you check off? And you say, yep, we have that one in place, we've done this one, this is good, yeah? Uh, if not, I think it would be very good to still look at that and have it in place. So it might also be for you to say like, okay, I don't fall on the NIST 2.0, but let's see what I need to do for it and make sure that I have those things in place. Um, when you then deliver to a NIST 2.0 compliant uh, comp uh, uh, company and they come to you and say like, hey, how, are everything, uh, how is everything arranged for you security-wise? What are your practices, incidents, responses, et cetera, et cetera? And they come with uh, their BDO consultant or their Ernst Young consultant that's doing the audit there. You might have seen those kind of uh, cases before and you get the 200 page questionnaire you have to fill out, right? But now you can just say like, hold it, hold it, wait, here's our NIST 2.0 uh, document. So I recommend everyone to just look at this and say like, what can I check off? What's in place and what is not in place? And then look at it, how you can get it in place because I think it's very important. All right, supervision and enforcement. This again is when the uh, companies are on the NIST 2.0 and this is mostly for the essential companies, obviously then they will really have authorities to go after these companies, do on-site inspections, off-site supervision, do random checks, do audits. Now, you see a lot of little dots there, and this is where the NIST 2.0 is like a big explanation of what that means and what, it, uh, what the uh, country should do there. <coughs> so I just left it as... Uh, to give you the notion of what, uh, what things can do. Now, if regularly the things are not in order, they're not in, in place, then also the NIST 2.0 allows the uh, government to get sanctions there. And those sanctions are for 
uh, the essential companies a fine uh, of a maximum of at least 10 million euros or 2% of the total worldwide annual turnover. Um, the annual turnover is from the last fiscal year that you had. So if you had a really good year last year, um, that might even hurt more than the, the year you're at now. And for Annex 2, it's a, a fines up to 7 million and 1.4% of the total annual turnover. Also here, this is what, you, what I explained as well, temporarily banned from exercising manageable functions. Authorities have the power to request the imposition against any person with responsibilities. Right? So if somebody doesn't do their job, they actually can be uh, 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 banned from their function. Okay, when? When is this going to be uh, active, right? So in December, the EU signed off on the NIST 2.0. And for instance, Microsoft was actively involved with writing the NIST 2.0. We also looked at what, um, uh, what should those capabilities be? What can we put in there? But it's uh, 12 months from now. So the Netherlands right now has to look at uh, NIST 2.0, and they're very active with that as well, because you already see posts on it. Um, but it's, it's more like posts, we're working on it, we're getting there, we'll have something to announce soon. But when that comes out, you have 12 months to implement it. Um, and then, of course, it seems very long, but to write all your procedures, business continuity plan, check the whole chain of dependencies and everything, train everybody, then it's, of course, nothing. Um, so that's something I really recommend to, uh, to look into. Okay? Um, some things to show. So let's take a look at that um, cybersecurity defense. If I go to the homepage of the NSCS, uh, first topic here is already on uh, NIST 2.0. What does it mean for your organization? So they are already providing uh, insights there. Um, here also you find the uh, cybersecurity uh, um, uh, report on, on the Netherlands. Um, this is the, the Microsoft uh, document. So here you see the whole defense report. So this is what Microsoft sees. And you can see that's, uh, that's an interesting, interesting read as well. But it also has great uh, insights. So what you see here is that we have 65 trillion signals a day that we synthesize, uh, looking at uh, threats and uh, criminal uh, uh, cyber activity. We're blocking 4,000 identity attacks per second. Um, really uh, interesting, so many uh, domains to removed. And then if you look at how can we protect against 90% of the attacks, basic security hygiene, enable MFA, apply your zero trust principles, uh, make sure that you have XDR. And this is something that a lot of companies have point solutions. So if you have a separate antivirus product and you have a separate product that monitors your identity or your, uh, your anti-phishing, but you don't bring the data from these different solutions together into one solution, then you have some incidents in this portal, you have some incidents in that portal, but you don't have the correlation between those incidents. So only when you bring those incidents together, that software can then say like, oh wait, this is an attack pattern from, for instance, the Nobelium group. This is how they gain access to environments. So that's how I would uh, recommend to uh, really look into XDR, make sure you have a good seam to bring that uh, data together. Um, let's see. Okay, if you have any questions, I invite you to just uh, come forward. Uh, and which you can just uh, spend a line. Also, those of you that didn't get the uh, sneaky uh, Ninja security Microsoft cat, uh, I have some more uh, stickers here. Uh, I want to thank you very much for your time and, uh, and uh, having me here. Enjoy the rest of your day, and thank you. Thank you.